um, uh, to be here talking to. Uh, I see quite a few names, and I recognise quite a few names. Um, I don't know what you're all doing indoors, and you should be outdoors in this last day of sunlight before the the big storm hits us. Anyway, here I go. Um, what I'd like to do is just quickly uh, do a little bit of background for those that don't know um, me and Net. Um, just a, a few of the decision-making processes that I went through in deciding to do this. Um, I'm not going to talk about money um, at all, but we can talk about that in the chat afterwards if, if that's what people want to do. Um, I'm going to do a little bit of a dive into some of the results we've had from uh, the project. So there'll be um, slides on that. And there I've nicked them from the uh, full-time ecologist, Penny Green, um, that we employ at NEP. I'm then going to just try to place uh, where I think um, this type of project could sit uh, in lowland Britain. So I'm going to just place place her, NEP, uh, within that landscape, just to give us a, a, a talking point as well. Uh, very topical. I just thought I, I'd just add that in as a uh, as a as an idea of what how it all might fit into a, a new landscape that we should be creating for the future. Okay, um, so I'm going to he head head into this um, PowerPoint. Here are a couple of Tamworth pigs and some scrubland on NEP, um, keystone species for us. NEP is um, in West Sussex. It's uh, one of the most densely populated parts of Europe, um, sitting squeezed in between Crawley, Horsham, um, Chichester and Worthing and Brighton. It's 320 metres of clay cap and 10 acre fields. This is my, um, ah, hold on. I was told to use a system which I can't, can you see my cursor? Sorry, Keith. Um, not at the moment, Charlie. You should have some controls along the bottom if you move your cursor down to the bottom. Um, yes, you... okay. I see. That, that's it. That's it. Uh, yes, here we are. There you go. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Here, here's my father and my aunts, and, and they're standing in amongst some scrub. And this is part of the part of what happens in NEP in the in between the wars. This is the the dig for victory. The, here's the the machines that were that were taking out the scrub. This land was poor agricultural land. It is poor agricultural land. It is going to be hard always to compete on the commodity markets of the world. So this is this is the family witnessing the ripping out of all the scrub that had grown up during that period between the wars. That last big agricultural depression. Here's the Canadian Army in front of the castle, and here's a wheat field in the middle of a Repton Park. So again, war effort, um, the, the scrubbing out of old veteran trees, the ploughing up of the land and the growing of the grain, the big beginning of the huge changes that we've seen in our agricultural landscape, the beginning of the uh, Green Revolution. I spent um, three years at Siren Sister, um, uh, did advanced farm management my last year, came away thinking that I knew how to farm and how to do it. This is my daughter who's now at Oxford doing um, a PhD in zoology. And this is me sitting on top of a pile of wheat that we actually made money on uh, in the sort of mid 90s. Um, just to give you an idea, th this green line is the average wheat, uh, winter wheat yields uh, per hectare over a sort of 20 year period from the, from the beginning of the 70s to the end of the 90s. By the end of the 90s, we were two ton light of the national average um, on uh, yields of wheat. And that is pretty hard to come back on uh, in terms of uh, very low prices that you're getting and trying to compete in the world stage with the two ton light of the average uh, production is very difficult to do. So you can see I'm sort of painting a picture of the land being very poor. Um, during that same period, the milk prices, but we were big into dairy. We had 630 dairy cows and they were producing lots and lots of milk. Um, and But there was this huge pressure on downward pressure on price of milk. And I could see that if we were to stay in the dairy business, we would need to reinvest in, in the dairy industry. And um, I didn't want to do that. So I thought that we were coming to an end of an era. And the whole thing was then what should we do with the land? 
Along comes Franz Vera. I met Franz Vera in the mid '90s um, and got to know him over the uh, over the few years. Um, we then he then produced his uh, his uh, hypothesis in English in 2000, uh, Grey's in Ecology and Forest History, and I was really intrigued with what the, what what he was saying about grazing animals in a landscape, and so I started to think, well, okay, what about doing something on that with our land? We're not going to be in in the commodity game. We're going to be in a biodiversity game. So one of the the principles of uh, of France uh, that we were sort of learning was that there was drivers in the system that were missing, and um, these are the drivers that we came up with. The Tamworth pig is the proxy for the wild boar. It's a rootler. It 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 disturbs the soil. Um, I'm going to come back to that because it's come up with some interesting ideas of what it actually is doing, but it's a keystone species within our landscape. So really important we're thinking. Then you've got the heavy browsers, the, the, the deer species, and this is, this is the important animal to keep back, uh, we think, the landscape turning or reverting into just a closed canopy woodland. So here we've got our big heavy hitters, the animals that are, that are, that are fighting back against vegetation succession, just that sort of linear Tansley Clements idea of uh, ending up with a closed canopy forest. Then you've got the single stomach um, animal, the the horse. Um, they're all giving different traits to this landscape. They've all got different mouthpieces. They've all got different herd structures. They've all got different viruses they carry around in their mouths. They've got different ways of, of transporting seeds and nutrients and so on. So we're thinking that all of these animals are giving us different traits, different impacts to that environment. Old English longhorns. Um, Cattle are known to carry, I read one paper that was uh, say, saying that up to 230 different plant species uh, may be carried around on their, in their stomachs, on their fur, in their hooves, um, important vectors of movement of plants, but also uh, they disturb differently. They have a, a different mouthpiece, they have a different, uh, different number of stomachs, they, they do a, um, a, a browsing as well as grazing. So they're all, all these animals that you can see are giving us uh, different uh, different outcomes for different uh, plants and, and their environment. One of the intriguing ideas that um, I was being shown by the little bit of reading I've been doing around the whole subject um, was this idea of Rinterpest and, and Southern Africa. And I'm just showing you this as, a, as an idea. Here's NEP um, when we were just uh, straight out farming, conventional farming, and NEP then had this vegetation pulse. But what, in my head, what I've sort of worked out that the vegetation pulse was like Southern Africa, where you had a, a pathogen that w went through um, the population of wild and domesticated animals, uh, changed that scene hugely, and allowed a vegetation pulse in Southern Africa. And I was standing underneath some, some Mapani trees in, in uh, the Okavanga with uh, an ecologist, and he was saying that the trees we were standing under was from the last big vegetation pulse from the die-off die of animals in uh, that Rinterpest period in the 1890s. So it was that sort of thinking that was, was sort of driving me into, into more and more interesting ideas uh, leading down this path. So this landscape now is this, this um, I don't know, it's a scrubland controlled and, and, and directed by a whole lot of big mouths and big feet. Some of the, um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about some of the successes that we've had on NAP. And um, I, these are actually my, um, our ecologist's slides, and I, I've stolen them from Penny Green. Anyway, I'm just going to run through them. Um, one of the things that we have managed to do is, or she has really, because she's such a delightful person, is she's attracted an enormous amount of people to come and do stuff. And whether they're paid or, or whether they're just coming to to to, to do some freebies, um, there is just this enormous gang of people that are out there doing monitoring. So it's it's really with only with their help that we can actually say and do um, a lot of the things that we're doing. Um, they have th this is about two or three years old now, so Penny hasn't had time to. Um, to update it, but we have about 30,000 records with about 3,000 species. And I think she's telling me that we've added a lot to that species list. But anyway, we're, we're getting there. 
Um, 75 nationally notable scare species. That, that particular delightful beetle is a, is a fleabane beetle, and we've only ever found three of them. And we have about 300 acres of fleabane, so I'm not sure what's going on there. They, we should be um, inundated by these particular beetles. Um, 13 bat species um, are known to use the site or are breeding here. Barbastel now are breeding here. For instance, Beckstein's breeding here. So the bat, the bat numbers are doing really, really well. And we've got some lovely figures on, on bats um, uh, done by uh, Theresa Greenway and, and so on. Um, the scarce chase, I don't know why Penny particularly, uh, anyway, scarce chases, we've got lots of them. These are the uh, some of the some of the winners in, in the whole system, and we've got about twenty two red uh, list bird species. Some of the notable um, species that are regionally or nationally hotspot, we are hotspot for, are this lot um, and the purple amber butterfly. Uh, Matthew Oates is hugely involved with uh, with monitoring and looking at that, and Neil Hume. Um, you've got the nightingales, you've got the cuckoos, uh, and so on. Um, the geotropes, the the, the uh, violet door beetle, has also uh, appeared. Uh, after 50 years absence um, from Sussex. So these are the sort of the main headlines for um, some of the species that are that are here. Um, we do a lot of ringing. Um, Penny is a ringer and she has a team of people as, alongside uh, Tony Davis. Um, they're out uh, doing autumn and uh, spring ringing. Uh, these are some of the highlighted birds that uh, are using the scrub in the autumn. And we're getting sort of astonishing figures. I'll come back to that. We're also doing some work with the BTO. Um, we've ringed, uh, sorry, we've put GPS um, collars on um, some uh, cuckoos and we've watched them go back and forwards um, to uh, southern Af uh, to uh, the Sahara and that sort of part of Africa. Uh, so we're doing that sort of thing as well. Um, last autumn's ringing, um, there was about 1,500 birds ringed. Astonish, astonishing number of black caps were coming through, to, uh, 632. And they were caught within two and a half weeks in the autumn. And it's just an astonishing, and just one field. And it's astonishing just to see the sort of numbers of, of, a, of a blackberry eating bird. But that's the sort of, um, sort of data we're now collecting. Tony Davies, uh, Davis is sitting here in the middle of this group. These are tourists. Here's Penny Green and Dave Green and Laurie Jackson, and they're the ringing team, and but also the survey team for the birds, and they have lots of other people helping them. Tony has um, been ringing for about 30 years, and in a couple of weeks in September last, uh, no, 2018, he ringed more lesser white throats and black caps that he had that he had ever ringed in his entire life. So this is really. Um, you know the scale of the site with all the all this um, scrub coming gives you the extraordinary numbers as well as bi the biodiversity we're seeing. One of the things that Tony and his team uh, and Penny and, and her team uh, have been doing is they came up with this mad idea of doing a common bird census on 1,100 acres. And th this is just they they've been trying to collect the two years it's taken them to get around to collating this information. We're still not there, but this is just one of those bird species looking at 164 white throat territories in the southern block of the estate. So all, each little ring is a, is a territory. And just imagine when they start to do all the different species that are breeding on this site, what that map will look like. And we're working with a whole lot of other universities and, uh, and other groups, uh, looking at how that can be put a, overlaid onto um, uh, to thermal imagery maps and, and maps of uh, with using uh, ultraviolet and all that sort of technology. We, we're, we're having a lovely time um, with different universities doing different different projects on that. Just want to talk a little bit about um, the pigs and what they give us. This is um, an extraordinary uh, animal, and um, it's been very very. Uh, difficult to uh, to really tell what it's up to, um, it, it, what it's eating, what it's doing. But what we do know is that, that it that a fully grown Tamworth sow at two hundred and thirty kilos will plough up maybe thirty to sixty acres of land, and that gives us a whole lot of opportunities and other uh, other things going on. One of the studies we've been doing with um, uh, with the help of Reese. 
Green and uh, Ken Smith. Um, Ivan de Clay was put into play trying to catch turtle doves so that we could put um, GPS collars on them. And with all the ingenuity of Reese and Ken, they couldn't catch anything. They, he spent the whole summer trying to catch these birds. But they weren't coming down to feeding stations. They were just feeding out there in, in, the, in the scrubland. We've seen obviously a 93% decline in these species and, and uh, we have about singing, uh, 20 singing males and nap last year, or this year, sorry. So this, uh, this uh, rootling has given, we think, um, patches of uh, bare earth where these little plants can then take hold. And because they got these tiny leg legs, these, uh, these turtle doves, they, they're needing these bare patches to feed off. So we think we're doing really well both on feeding. Um, there's so much rootling. The pigs are giving space for this this little bird to, uh, to feed. But also we've obviously got the water and we've also got the, the the hedges and the and the scrub for them to nest in. So doing really well here. So perhaps the only growing population in the UK. The purple and red butterfly again feeding it back to the pig. And why I was talking about the pig, this um, uh, butterfly feeds off sallow, as you all not, will know. Um, Sallow needs uh, open, broken ground uh, in May for two and a half weeks that is that is wet and ready for the seed to drop in on. And this bu this butterfly has done unbelievably well here. Uh, in 2015, um, we got the second highest tally ever in the UK. Uh, in line with national trends, it dropped to, in 2016. And in um, 2017, it went up to 148 in the transect that Neil, Neil and um, Neil Hume and uh, Matthew Oates was doing. But in 2018, they got a whacking 388 in, in that season. So astonishing numbers of these purple and butterflies because we have this pig sallow association, I think. Uh, nightingales, well, we're well known for nightingales. There's been a huge decline in nightingales, as you all know. Uh, we have uh, had uh, 28 singing males last season. They have uh, moved into, migrated into these uh, hedges that are all growing out. You get these scalloped edge hedges, which are about 14 metres wide, and you get this sort of cathedral-like structure where they're feeding in. And they're nesting down here, right down on the edge of, the, uh, of these hedges. Soil. Sussex, um, in the old Sussex dialect, we have a 30 words of, of, for mud. Um, and I'm not, <laughs> not going to read them out, but it's just lovely to think about, uh, uh, you know, what, what, we're, what we're living on here in Sussex, this, this weald and clay. And in the background, I've got some pictures of some a little bit of survey work doing on, on, on soils. Um, we have been uh, lucky to work with Jim Harris and his team, and we're um, part of a, a partnership with him and, and Cranfield on a NERC-funded uh, project on soil, so we will know more and more. But the work that Laura did um, a couple of years ago, uh, looking at NEP soil compared to um, a control next door, um, we have doubled our uh, our soil carbon, organic carbon, um, doubling of our soil organic matter, uh, microbial biomass is more than doubled, fungal biomarkers more than tripled, and so on. I know that soil is incredibly complex, and, and um, but it's a good indication that there's some things going on here that are looking really quite good for soil. One of the things I love is dung beetles and, and done quite a lot of uh, study, not studying dung beetles, but watching dung beetles, I suppose. I'm such an amateur at all this. But um, we did another study, Sarah Brompton did. Um, she caught 12,178 dung beetles in a day. And it, this is in July um, 2018. And she then compared that with um, an organic site, two uh, organic, organic farms on Weald and Clay, and um, the NEP site was just astonishing. And we have obviously um, cattle and these, all these animals are out all year round. So they're not, they're not being put in houses or anything. So they are producing dung all year round. And I guess that is why we're seeing such a huge difference in our dung beetle numbers, other than the fact that we don't use ivermectins and so on. So how does this all fit into, um, into lowland Britain? And I'm just going to place... Um, th this is this is a, a photograph I took off the internet, and it's got 
some pretty good features in here the green and pleasant land it's got monocultures of grasses it's got uh, hedges that are cut to the quick no margins i can't see any margins in this landscape so they haven't followed any of the the um the government's uh, hope that people were going to be joining them uh, on doing margins and all the rest of it but there's nothing here you've got a, a pretty small little uh, single species plantation down here the only good bit of ecology you can see or uh, is probably this little bit here and it's been uh, stripped through ripped through with a with a dual carriageway you've got a canalized river anyway it's sort of a pretty typical scene in britain now isn't it and and i just so i just found this image and i just got i, I got to drawing on it and painting on it with with uh, with my very basic um sort of uh, techniques and i thought that well, i thought the result was not too good so i then um discovered jerome helmer and jerome's a an ecologist and he's an artist and lives in holland and i thought i'd work with him to see if i could repaint this picture so we started off with this this uh, image we then overlaid it with a series of photo uh, paintings by jerome i'm going to ask you to uh, just think that this is a rewilded area over here and that maybe this is an MOD site over here. So how do we join up these two sites? Here are two key big functioning ecosystems that we're now wanting to join up. And the sort of John um, the John Lawton principles of uh, connectivity here is a, a corridor. And I've and I've put in here, or at least Jerome has put in here, a massive herd of bison. And I hope you'll all be excited by the idea of bison. Um, it'll make your uh, surveying and, and all the things you do much more exciting. You have a lot of bison running around. Anyway, you can see an immediate problem in that we've got um, some splits in our corridor. Corridors obviously um, need to be completely connected. And, and uh, I don't know quite why we're so hopeless at this. Um, it should be in every single plan, every single um, net game principle plan of development and everything should be money to be reconnecting our landscapes not not only for wildlife but also for humans so I'm, I, I've got you know cycle path here and everything else um, this obviously happens in Europe a lot and we're all familiar with that I think we've got two and a half of these uh, green bridges so-called green bridges in the UK a half because uh, one of them isn't really functioning that well so again I know that Bill's uh, in, in the meeting room and he'll be looking at the evidence of these things and how they work and function. Then you've got the, um, this is a net hedge and we've now got uh, door mice in this hedge row. We've got the, the three sites for the nightingale. This is, a, a, this is now 14 meters wide and it's got, a, it's got a ditch in the bottom and it's an incredibly important corridor for, for wildlife. So this this landscape's looking a little bit better. It's got a it's got a, a connection between the two hotspots in, in SSSIs or National Nature Reserves or MOD or rewilding sites or whatever they are, and the hedges are all beginning to look a little little bit better. But we know that around our fields, if we put in uh, uh, strips of of uh, for, bir for bird dusting or for uh, uh, sacrificial crops or pollinating insects, all that sort of thing, we know that works. We had the, the study that was done, uh, commissioned by the RSPB, uh, looked at a five-year study and looked at the total yields coming out of a thousand hectare site. And the yield didn't uh, didn't suffer giving back, I think it was 8% of the land to these strips. So I think we could have some of that. We could do that and and, and it does work. And we, 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 we've got the knowledge that it does work. And it doesn't affect the actual outputs. In fact, on beans, it improved the outputs by 36%. Then the big revolution is coming, and I, and, and I don't know how many of you have been following regenerative farming, and uh, it's been a really slow burn. I mean, it's been 30 years, perhaps, when people were starting to talk about this. Um, but suddenly, in the last four or five years, it's really taken off, and it's been um, really due to people like Gay Brown and David Montgomery, that have really sort of highlighted this whole um, this whole field, as well as others, other players like Joel Salatin was an early mover. But there's also Charlie Massey from Australia, who in his book, Call of the Reed Board, but talks about 26 different sites in Australia. We're all practicing regenerative agriculture. And I think that's gonna be one of the most exciting uh, and interesting um, uh, changes in, in how we're gonna see agriculture moving forward.
Charlie, uh, yeah. 25 minute warning, but everybody's so amazed that they're not asking any questions. Oh. So just keep going. <laughs> okay. Um, so here we are, we've got regenerative agriculture in this landscape, and that means soil. That means you've, you, you, you've got your soil biota back. You're, you're using your agricultural system to feed soil, you feed your, your insects and feed your uh, fungi and your bacteria. So that becomes the feeding station for everything, the building blocks for the entire, the entire landscape. Obviously, um, I'm going to put in wood, wood pasture here. I've, I've chucked in a bit of wood pasture here because I think um, that's the, sort of the, the pure, the tip pure net model. And we know now that we can do things like um, no fence. Um, there's technologies out there. You put uh, collars on your cattle, and you can you can move them through that landscape and, and restrict their access to areas that you feel sensitive and so on. So there's a whole new load load of technologies that we can do that actually gives us outcomes with a bit more control. Then obviously the uh, the, the big win um, is remarrying um, canalised uh, systems uh, with their floodplains. So here's an incredible picture. I, 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 I said to Jerome, we've got to put links in because we've all got to start talking about this, this animal and how it may be um, really good at controlling this animal over here and this animal here. So I think I've got, uh, Jerome's put a, put a links in stalking my beaver. We've got a black stork. We've got a pine martin chasing a red squirrel. We've got red deer. We've got elk. We have uh, bison. Anyway, and we've got people. And um, this whole braided river system with its with its um, flood pain, with a dynamic system, I think that's uh, just such a wonderful image um, to start thinking about. We did a two and a half um, kilometer stretch of re-meandering re a canalized river system. So we brought in the Environment Agency, um, came in with a huge amount of diggers and, and re-meandered, putting it back in its old meander. And then um, you know, down the line, we've been planting uh, trees as well, just to give more shade to some of the stretches uh, in anticipation for our beavers to come in and start to cut down those, those very trees we plant and then start the whole dynamic uh, floodplain system. So I think that's going to be a, a, a you know we just got to concentrate on uh, on this this real problem we have with polluted river systems. Um, the other thing I suppose to add to the regenerative agriculture um, is that we are going to be facing more and more people, and with those more and more people, we are going to get and we're going to have to get cleverer and cleverer at producing. Uh, more food from less space with less energy use. So I've put in here greenhouses uh, next door to uh, uh, towns. Greenhouses are going to be, I think, much, much part of the, the future as well. But also perhaps precision fermentation and precision biology and fly farming. These are all things that are going to be producing carbohydrates and proteins um, for additives to, uh, to food and to the food system. And I think, you know, I, I, I've got a friend who's just come back from North America and they had invested in a fly farm in North America. And he said you couldn't see the end of the building without a pair of binoculars. It's happening. This, you know, it's already it's already there. It's, it's coming along. So that's going to be also be part of this this future of how we're going to produce food. I've put in here a whole lot of um, wonderful wildflowers because I think we ought to, as a society, uh, carry on funding and restoring um, these rich wildflower systems. And that's a very cultural landscape. It's not to do with rewilding. It's just a, a it's a, obviously a very diverse and brilliant species rich um, area. Um, I'm nearly coming to the end now. Um, one of the things that uh, worries me in the whole uh, idea of planting trees and the 600 million going into that is that we keep on, I keep on banging on about the first thing, the default should be natural regeneration. What are we planting these trees for? If it's for biodiversity, if it's for carbon sequestration, um, we're not a timber growing country. We're too warm. We're getting warmer. We're too wet. We grow too fast. All that timber's got to come from elsewhere. What are we growing this, the, 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 these treescapes for? And I would say it's carbon and, and, and uh, biodiversity. If that's the outcomes we're wanting, then this picture is what we're wanting to do and make changes about. So default must be, I think, is natural regeneration. If we're wanting to produce um, timber and we're wanting to produce um, firewood, then uh, continuous canopy forestry could be a really interesting uh, idea. Obviously, this needs to exclude things like deer. 
um, understory does get hammered in, in these systems with, uh, with grazing and browsing animals. So you've then got to control wild animals coming into those areas. You also then got to keep on thinking how to improve this landscape. So you never stop. You, this is, I've just put in another corridor here because it, just to show that it, you need to keep on thinking how to make it more and more functional. Anyway, it's be, it's the year of the rat, um, but for us at NEP, uh, it's now the year of the beaver because we have now got our beavers um, uh, it back in our landscape. We have a the first of its kind, a license to release two pairs of beavers in a 250 hectare area, and we have only built um, structures or, or, or beaver fences uh, 50 metres away either side of a, a, a water coming in or, or leaving the site. Anyway, that's it for me. Um, I'm going to then hand back to um, Keith and work out where I do that. Uh, no, it's okay. Thank you, Charlie.